as we go through the last chapter of Moed Katan, we're revolving around the principle that although we don't work on Chol Moed, we don't work on the intermediate days, we do actually carry out anything that is really required. So those, those are the principles. We don't work, but we do do what is required. Those are the principles we need to keep in mind. And now we're going to go through a series of Mishnayot, which are linked. Um, they're linked by those principles, but they're also linked linguistically. So we're back into halachic poetry, if you like, or Mishnaic poetry. And they all begin with the words ve'elu and these. Uh, yesterday, in the previous Mishnah, we learned ve'elu megalchin, and these are allowed to shave. And there's a whole list of people coming from abroad or coming out of captivity or coming out of prison or someone who's been excommunicated or who the sage has released. And similarly, it's someone who asked a sage to be released from a vow and was Release it. We learned this whole list of people that can shave on the intermediate days. And we said, look, we don't want people to organize their shaving on the intermediate days. But if someone doesn't have a chance before the festival, they can do it in those intermediate days. And now the Mishnah continues in the second Mishnah of the chapter, the same language. We had Elu Megalchen, and now we've got the Elu Mechabsin. And these launder. So we're moving from shaving to laundry. You see how the, it's very interesting how the Mishnah moves incrementally from subject to subject. So the Elu Mechabsin, so these launder during the festival, and it's the same list. It's exactly the same list that we looked at when we were talking about shaving. It's exactly the same list. Someone coming back from abroad or someone coming out from a place of captivity or coming out of prison or excommunicated whom the sages kind of lightened up on. And someone who asked a sage to be released from a vow, this would be a, a vow not to laundry, not carry out laundry. What a great vow. I vow I will not touch the laundry. But the sage released him. And then there's a list of things that we launder. This is, again, this is very interesting. Meat pachot, hyodine, hand towels. And clearly these are things that get regularly, they get dirty very regularly. And we need to wash them to keep them keep them going. So we we um, we launder these things. Umid pachot hasfarim. These are book towels, and I, I, I the, some of the commentators say these are um, some of the commentators that say these are the cloths that we cover a sefer Torah with. And I don't know why you would want to launder that on the intermediate days of the festival. Well, I mean, if it gets dirt, doesn't get very dirty, why don't you launder it before? I, I don't know. And there are some versions of this text, not in the Kaufman, not in the manuscript we're looking at. But there are some versions of this text that say, umit bachot has saparim. So saparim rather than safarim. And there's just a tiny difference in pronunciation, but a sapar is a barber and a safer is a scroll. So maybe these are towels that belong to barbers, but hang on, we know we're not really shaving on the intermediate day. So what does that make sense? I'm not sure. Anyway, Kaufman has, explicitly has safarim. They are book towels in some way. We wash them on cholam wet. Umit bachot ha svag and bath towels. Again, they get dirty very often. Hazavim vehazavot vehanidot vehayoldot. And people who have an emission, zavim and zavot, and menstruants, and women who give them birth, all these are people who are liable to stain their clothes. And again, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to be walking around on cholamoed with stained clothes. So clearly they're allowed to wash their clothes because they, I mean, they maybe they did wash them before the festival, but these are people who have a you know they've got conditions that make clothes stained and we don't embarrass people on cholam white so they wash them and then um the cholha olin mi tumalatara and 
anybody who's going from Tumata to Haraf, from impurity to purity, because they have to wash. They have to wash their clothes. They have to put on clean clothes. Haray elu muturin. These people are permitted. Ushach kol adam asurin. And other people don't launder. So these are people that launder. These are exceptional exceptions for laundry, but other people generally don't, don't launder. And now the Mishnah continues with the same language. We had ve'elu ha megalchin, these people shave, and ve'elu mechabsin, these people launder. And now we've got ve'elu kotvin bamoed, and these write, or I've translated here as these may be written, because the you see, we're talking poetry here, it's ve'elu kotvin, but actually what follows is not so much a list of authors but a list of things that are written um maybe we're saying oh these write these are people these these write these are people that write these things and we we've said that we carry out work on Cholhamoed that we carry out work on Cholhamoed that can't be put off so here's a list of urgent items things that we might need to write documents for, but they can't be put off, or there's some urgency anyway. If you become engaged, you can give a woman a ring. And we normally do that today, actually. We, we give a, a woman a ring and we say, here you are betrothed. But you don't have to do it with a ring. You could go, You could do it with a document. You could give her a piece of paper that says, you are betrothed to me. And Kiddushin actually works with paper just as much as it works with silver, with 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 a ring. So when we say Kiddushin Hashim, we're talking about the paper that you might hand to a woman and say, you're betrothed to me with this kind of, by this document. It's in. Um, divorces, I, I guess, I, I guess if someone needs to be divorced, we write the divorce document immediately just in case, I don't know, someone changed their mind. Or the example given in the commentators is if someone wanted to leave town, maybe someone sailing away to a distant place, he may not be able to give the get if he doesn't do so instantly. So we write the get on Cholamwed. The shovarin, shovarin are receipts. This might be the receipt for the get, actually, a woman to write, oh, yeah, I've received the get. Or it might be a receipt for something else, maybe for the repayment of the loan. It's not clear. Daiteiki. Daiteiki, that's a Greek word, and it refers to the bequests of a dying person. So when someone's on his deathbed, they may make, they may dispose of their possessions. And we're going to write down their wishes of course but again we can't delay doing that because they may they may not live until they're in the end of the festival so we write this down on Holomwood. matana um presents gifts i guess because the giver might change his mind maybe you're going to give your sons your friends something maybe you'll change your mind anyway you write that down uprosbulin a prosbul is a document that allows us to to roll alone over the seventh year over the sabbatical year and people did, some people were reluctant to lend without the prosbol, without being able to roll the loan over for the sabbatical year. And we'll see in a minute that lending documents are really quite important, even on Cholamwed. And we'll see the rest of these, the, 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 the next few items actually come in the category of lending. So we've got Igrot Shum, we've got valuation letters. The Igrot Mazon, um, these are really, uh, Igrot Shum is a valuation letter. Again, probably when we're taking security for a loan, Igrot Mazon are orders for food, literally, for support. If a court sells documents to buy food for a, an orphan or a widow. Shitrei Chalitza Umunin, documents of Chalitza or of repudiation. Veshitrei Brura and... Um, uh, she tray brew, uh, sorry, she tray brew rin. These are arbitration documents. Ugzerot beit din, decrees of the court. The igrot shelar, the igrot shelirushut. Let this seems to me letters to the government. It's as though if you had to write a letter to the government, this might be a fatal issue, and we have to do it. We we can't put it off until after the holiday. 
And then we're going to carry on the question of loans. We're going to break the pattern of ALU. And we're going to go on to the pattern. We're going to just talk a little bit more about loans because loans could be matters of life or death. Actually, in principle, we don't write loan documents during the festival. We don't do it. But there's always a but. Maybe the, I mean, you can make a loan, right? I mean, a verbal contract for a loan works in halacha, it works in Jewish law, just as it does in English law, actually. You can make a contract for a loan verbally. But here's the but. If someone doesn't trust him, i.e. the lender doesn't trust the borrower, then we're prepared to write out the document we're prepared to write out the document on Cholamoed or 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 maybe he doesn't have any food to eat he may write so we can write out a loan document if the lender doesn't trust the borrower or if someone doesn't have enough to eat and I when you read this Mishnah first of all you think the borrower doesn't have enough to eat. And maybe we need to contract this loan in order that this borrower can eat on, on, on Yamta. But of course, thinking about it carefully, we've already said, you know, you can make a loan for someone to survive verbally. And if the borrow, if we don't trust the borrower, we can make it, we can write down a loan document anyway. So what is this thing about not eating? And the Rambam explains, it's such a beautiful statement of the Rambam. I brought it on the source sheet. He says, um, etc. They don't we don't write loan documents, etc. If he doesn't have anything to eat, he writes and sells. He actually well, when the someone who doesn't have something to eat, this is the scribe. The scribe doesn't have anything to eat. Because, of course, he's out of work on Cholam Moed because no one wants to write anything. So if he ha doesn't have anything to eat, we're going back to the principle. We can do work if we need to do work. If he doesn't have anything to eat, he can write. And then along the same lines, we don't write scrolls or tefillin or muzuzot during the festival. We don't even correct a single letter a feel of a safer other even this even in a, the the safer of the azara the scroll of the azara the, the azara here seems to refer to the temple the court literally an azara is a courtyard so literally this is the the, the scroll of the courtyard but we seem to be talking about the scroll of the temple here even if and by the way there's a recognition that even the scroll that sits in the temple might have a mistake in it and might need to be corrected. Really, really interesting insight into scribal accuracy in the time of the Mishnah and the fact that the sages recognize that our, our scrolls are not accurate. They do need to be corrected. But not on Cholam word. It's not urgent. I guess because we know what the correct reading is. So why do we need to correct the scroll? Rabbi Udal Mer, Rabbi Udal says, Rabbi Yudas says a person can write to fill in and muzuzot for himself because he's not a professional. We've seen this before. We don't do professional work on Yom Tov, but we can do DIY. We can do our, our own work on Yom on on, on Ved. And he can spin on his thigh. Again, we're not spinning in the normal way. We're not spinning using a um, spindle, but we're just spinning on his thigh the blue thread for his tzitzit. So again, we're working on cholam but we're not working in a professional way. We're doing stuff that we, we're doing DIY. We're doing stuff that we need at home.